Uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 12741. On December 6, 1941, I went to Lualai to spend a quiet weekend with friends who lived on the Army Post. The morning of December 7th, we went on an early hike. After returning to the quarters, we were eating breakfast when, all of a sudden, there were ten long sirens. I soon learned that that was the signal for every man to leave his quarters and report for duty at his job on the post. I recall my friend jumped up from the table and left without saying a word to anyone. Shortly thereafter, the telephone rang and it was an officer calling from Fort Shafter who asked if we would contact the officer in charge there at the Lualuale ad building. He said he had been trying to reach him but had not been able to do so. I immediately volunteered to go to the ad building and upon reaching there I relayed the message to the officer on duty. When I returned to my friend's quarters, which was only a short distance from the ad building, I saw seven planes overhead flying toward Pearl Harbor in the formation of a V. We had been having blackouts and practice alerts since the previous May, so no one was too concerned about the planes overhead. However, by the time I got back to the quarters, I could see the insignia on the planes and the pilots in the planes. Wow. At the time, there were only two radio stations on the island. The one was playing music and the other was asking every serviceman to report to his post immediately. Lualuale is where the ammunition is stored underground for the whole island. A railroad track leads to the entrance of the underground depot and a railroad car on the track made it impossible for any ammunition to be gotten out and delivered to the gun sites on the island. I'm sure many people listening to the radio that morning thought the message for all to report for duty was part of the island's practice alert. That is, until the radio station was asking for all doctors and all nurses to make themselves available for the vicious attack by the Japanese Navy. The station kept repeating, this is not a practice alert. We are being attacked by the Japanese. My friend and I, both government workers, decided to head back to the office in Honolulu. As we rounded the bend, there lay Pearl Harbor. One ship was already exposing its keel. It's hard to describe the scene with all the black smoke and fire shooting from all directions. As was the custom, many battleships were lined up in a row so that one could work, could walk from one ship to another. Now you could see nothing but smoke and fire. We saw a Japanese plane drop a bomb into the stack of a hospital ship. Damage done to a ship at the entrance of the harbor prevented any other ship from getting out of the harbor. No, we didn't lie down in the ditch at the side of the road during the bombing. We were too stunned by it all. We just stood there and watched, unable to believe it was really happening to our Navy and to Hickam Field next door. We proceeded on to Honolulu, a distance of about seven miles, wondering what would happen next and fearing there might be another group of planes on the way to Hawaii. Uh, back in Honolulu, I saw a couple of trucks filled with dead Army and Navy personnel en route to a temporary burial cemetery near the Pali. Later, we were told they were buried at Red Hill Cemetery near Pearl Harbor. We reported to work at the Corps of Engineer Office on the seventh floor of the Young Hotel, which is in the center of downtown Honolulu, only two or three blocks from the Aloha Tower, where all the cruise ships stopped. I was secretary to Colonel Theodore Wyman, district engineer in charge of the Corps of Engineers in Honolulu. Mattresses were thrown down by desks and when we could work no longer, we rested a bit uh, as best we could on the mattresses. Even though I lived at the Blaisdell Hotel only two blocks from the office at the Young Building, I didn't get home for the next three days. After that, part of the office was moved to Punahou University so that the Corps of Engineers of C of E would be able to operate in the event the Young Hotel building was bombed. I moved to Punahou with Colonel Wyman and his immediate staff. The first visitors of Punahou to see Colonel Wyman were General Short and Admiral Nimitz, heads of the Army and Navy. Their visit was to place the blame of the Pearl Harbor attack on the C of E, since the aircraft warning stations from Hawaii no strategic, uh, strategic outlying islands in the Pacific were not completed as scheduled. 
schedule. They, you know, they argued with Colonel Wyman, had they been completed, we would have been able to detect the planes before they reached Hawaii. The truth is that the aircraft warning stations had not been completed because the necessary material had not been received from the U.S. mainland, even though it had been requested many times. General Short and Admiral Nimitz were hoping to place the blame for the attack on Colonel Wyman, who had come up through the ranks and was not a graduate of West Point, as was General Short. Politics is a rough game, and they succeeded by getting Colonel Wyman released and assigning uh, as district, in, uh, district Engineer Colonel Lyman, the first native Hawaiian to graduate from West Point. I stayed on as Colonel Lyman's secretary until I received word in April of 42 of the death of my brother, an Air Force pilot, at which time I returned to Ohio. And that's it. And you wrote that to a Chinese student? Yes, he was, he was here, living here, and um, he had to write a paper. Uh, he was a senior, and I was in Florida, so I scribbled this out and uh, uh, he put it on his VCR or whatever. Yeah. That must evoke a tremendous amount of emotions. When you read that, I mean, just your... Uh, yeah, it just takes me way back. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for doing all of this. I want to thank you. We're going to talk a little bit about Reverend Venberg and his uh, participation in World War II. Finally, on Christmas Day in an epic tank battle, the American 2nd Armored Division stopped the German 2nd Panzer Division in a confrontation on the farm fields surrounding Salise, Belgium. The 75th Infantry Division and other American forces joined in the counterattack. A few weeks after the battle ended, Winston Churchill summed it up in a speech before the House of Commons when he called it America's greatest victory of the war. We're fortunate today to have one of those folks who was part of the, <coughs> one of the greatest victories of the American War, uh, Reverend Venberg. Uh, I remember our um, high school principal called us, all of the boys, into uh, the auditorium, and he said, boys, uh, from this day on, your life is changed forever. He said, I don't want you to do anything drastic, and enlist right away, but just get back to your books and do the best you can and wait till your government calls you up. You're 17 and you have a choice. You have mm -hmm. a choice of whether to wait for the draft or enlist. Uh, it sounded like you decided to enlist, why? So I could get out of the infantry. <laughs> At that time, it was a point in the war in 1943 when they needed an awful lot of manpower, specifically in combat and um, I did not want to go in the infantry, and there was a program called the Army Specialized Training Program that you could in, uh, join if you qualified for it, and you would then go to college. And uh, as it turned out, I did go to college, the University of Maine, for one semester when I was 17. Then having turned 18, I was to go into basic training, get uh, infantry basic, and then return to college in uniform. And while I was in the uh, uh, basic training program, they closed the ASTP program and put us all in the infantry. So your plan worked very well. It worked well, <laughs> yeah. It worked well for them, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> Into France, and mm -hmm. France, what, what were your orders there? Uh, there we, we bivouacked for three days in freezing rain it was just awful conditions there. And then uh, early one morning, we uh, rolled up our, uh, sleeping, our sleeping bags and our uh, shelter halves, rolled them up in fr freezing. It was an awful, um, uh, uh, awful procedure. Got into trucks and drove all the way across France and through Belgium and up to the border of Belgium and Germany. And there we debarked and bivouacked and then got settled down. My uh, regiment was held in reserve, and the other two regiments were put up on line. About yeah. timeline, was this would have been December of, of 
44? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, it was early December 44. Yeah. Did you get a sense of what your mission might be? Well, we had been assured that it would be a quiet place in the line, that we would get some experience in combat there, and that we would just sort of shape up and it would be a good thing for us. Um, as it turned out, it was a, a very broad, ga uh, broad uh, area that we had to cover. I think it was 27 miles across with some gaps in the line of about a thousand yards, uh, some places that were not protected at all. Some of the information we got back from our patrols that went out told us that these were experienced troops that we were facing. And there were rumors also of a buildup that was taking place but uh, we discounted those reports, and, and then, as it turned out, our intelligence uh, discounted those reports, too, um, much to our surprise. When were you brought up to the front? Uh, it was on the first day of the battle. Okay. Yeah. The first place? idea that we had that anything was going wrong was an awful roar outside of the little uh, house that we were housed in. It sounded like a motorcycle just outside our window, barking away. It was a V-1 bomb that was going over, overhead. And uh, then we felt that something was going on. And then we got all rounded up <clears throat> and uh, into trucks and rolled on up to the, the front. Then. So this would have been December 16th? 16th, yeah. <laughs> It is no show place this time, not wealthy, not well known. Before what happened here in December 1944, or even since. For seven days, history paused at a crossroads in this Belgian Ardennes village and then passed on. Unless we can call history the echoes that ring in the memories of the men who make it, as they did in the battle at saint -Vith. Three German armies would launch the massive counteroffensive to split the Allied forces and capture their best port of supply, Antwerp. What would end as the greatest pitched battle ever fought by American troops, the Battle of the Bulge, would burst without warning on a quiet sector on the First Army Front. The veteran exhausted 28th and the 4th Divisions to the south, and by the newly arrived 106th, thinly spread at the center. Conditions were fairly miserable. It was intermittently raining and snoring. We were relieving the 2nd Infantry Division. We as a brand new, young, inexperienced division were being moved into their position to take up uh, the defense of that particular sector. The ser seriousness of this situation finally became evident to 8th Corps later in the day, at which point they attached to us uh, primarily the Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division. Since the 7th Armored Division was to counterattack through Colonel Riggs' position to the east, General Hogue was instructed to attack to the southeast when his armor arrived. There, another regiment of the 106th was cut off. But the 7th Armored Division was headquartered some 60 miles away to the north in Holland. And there was little urgency in the cry for help that finally reached his commander, General Robert Hasbrook. Since the Schnee Eiffel is practically covered with trees, the terrain is extremely obscure. The young soldier hears fire from the right, from the left, behind him, and in front of him. Some people advance, others go back. There was quite some confusion, which facilitated our advance through the Schnee Eiffel towards Schoenberg. I met the first prisoners at noon on December 18th, on my way from the northern part of the Schnee Eiffel via Bleialf to Schoenberg. I must say they seemed rather confused. The questioning of young people confirmed that this was a division which apparently had been newly assembled, or at least contained a great number of men with no war experience. We could then, in the dawn's light, see that all the roads leading into saint Vith were full of German troops uh, concentrating on and going through uh, saint Vith. We obviously could not counterattack. I attempted at that time to 
split them up into patrols so they could uh, attempt to work their way back to the friendly lines, the U.S. lines. We started two of these patrols out and watched both of them captured. And shortly thereafter, uh, I was captured with the remainder of the group. You lived it uh, mm -hmm. from December 16th through December 21st, 1944. As you were watching that, what memories came back? Well, those scenes of uh, uh, going through the woods at the top of that Schnee Eiffel uh, Ridge, very familiar to me. It's exactly the way it was, and I, I was in the midst of that. Um, the, uh, the confusion that they spoke of was, yes, very real. It was uh, just, uh, there was so much confusion because we had lost contact with our artillery. We didn't have any armor, uh, and uh, our uh, officers' commands, they, they were dispersed. So it, it, was, uh, it was a very difficult time. And uh, the, uh, the first action that we saw, um, we, um, uh, we confronted a group of um, Germans that had held a high position and of open ground there. And uh, we captured a sniper and a, a machine gun crew, and we chased off a um, uh, artillery battery that was it was firing point blank at us, and um, it, it's a horrible experience when a shell lands on one side of you, and then lands on another side. You know pretty well where the next one is going to come, and uh, it it was uh, it was a tough experience on open ground no chance to dig in and just uh, slug it out uh, with the enemy. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, uh, we made our way further to where there had been a, a terrific uh, battle. Uh, there were burning vehicles there, uh, some tanks and jeeps and trucks all over. We didn't see any bodies. They had, must have been taken away by that time. But uh, we could see that uh, there was a lot of violence that had taken place there. And then from there on, the next few days are so confused I can hardly remember them. Uh, but I do remember the last day uh, we tried to take the village of Schoenberg, which was mentioned on the... We were hoping to make, get Schoenberg <clears throat> and then push on to St. Vith and then to break out. <clears throat> and um, we found that uh, at Schoenberg, an armored column of the Germans had already taken the place. And that was where we, we just were stopped dead, uh, out of ammunition, uh, or running low on ammunition. And we hadn't had any food for four days, and we had wounded lying on the ground, not able to dig in. And uh, it, uh, that's where it, it ended for us. Uh, I saw the surrender take place. <clears throat> Uh, the Germans put up a white flag first, and uh, they came over to our side and talked to our officers, and our officers went over to their side then for a while, and um, then they came back and then told us that we had to surrender. And it was, it was a bitter and a, a shameful experience uh, to have to go through to actually know that it was over for you. Well, for instance, I was carrying some uh, codification devices and binoculars and things like that, and we were told to eject those things and bury them in, in foxholes, too, and, and I did that. The uh, small arms ammunition, uh, no, we were just told to put our weapons down. And mm -hmm. Some of the guys did break their weapons and you know, took the bolts out and so on, did their best. But there wasn't much point in it. Literally marching across lines, uh, what was the, the, the morale like? What was the sense of, did you, this was a, a, a temporary matter or was it something that you didn't know what you were embarking on? Well, I think the, we were quite confident. We, we were quite confident that somehow we were, we were going to get out of that mess. And I remember talking to our executive officer. He was a first lieutenant who had been in Africa, had um, gotten a, um, a silver star and a battlefield commission, and then returned to the States and joined us and went over with us. 
And um, it was that last day I, I said to him, Lieutenant Miller, do you think we're going to get out of this? And uh, he said, uh, I never saw it as bad as this in all of Africa. You were injured. <clears throat> yeah. Describe that. Well, it was there at Schoenberg the last day. And um, I, had, I had made my way up to the uh, firing line. We had formed a skirmish line. Uh, with, with nothing but our rifles to, uh, to fire. And I knew that somebody was supposed to charge across that open field and take those tanks, but it wasn't going to be me. And, it, and I think the others had the same idea too. We, we, didn't, we didn't get any command to move forward. I think our officers knew that uh, this was it for us. Well, there was an armored car down on the road, and he was peppering us with uh, exploding shells. I guess it was anti-aircraft or something like that, just raking us up and down the line. <clears throat> and um, his, um, his uh, fire missed me one time going down, but coming back, one shell exploded right under my um, uh, rifle barrel. And, uh, and it, it, um, it knocked me out. Um, I thought that I was dead. In, in the midst of all that sound and fury and everything, I did feel like a raindrop hitting my, the sleeve of my, uh, uh, my uh, jacket. And it was a piece of shrapnel that went through. Um, I started to come to, and I couldn't feel anything, couldn't hear anything, but I could see. And I thought, well, Venberg, this is the end for you. It's your last sight of the world, and say goodbye to it, and, uh, and meet your maker. And, uh, but then the senses began to come back to me, and I realized I felt the blood uh, uh, filling up in the sleeve of my jacket, and um, I knew that I had been hit. But I didn't feel any pain or anything from it. And, it was, it was time for me then to pull back and, and take shelter behind a tree and see just what uh, came of it. Uh, I called for an aid man, and I'd like to say at this time, the, the real heroes that I remember of that time were the aid men. Uh, we had one, we only know his, knew him as Slim, and the last I saw of him, uh, one of our scouts was out front, and word came back that he had been hit. And uh, the last I saw of Slim, he was going down an open, uh, a forward slope, directly into enemy fire, and to the side of that scout. And I regard, I, I never saw him again after that as a hero. And their role, the, the role of an aide was what? Well, to, to, to render first aid, to get to the, the side of a, uh, an aid man, uh, the one who came to me <clears throat> got a, um, a bandage on my arm, and he said, cheer up, you'll get a purple heart for this. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was, I guess it was what they call a million dollar wound. It's enough to get you out of action, but not enough to cripple you or, or, or kill you. Oh, by that time, probably a couple hundred. Couple hundred. Yeah, probably a couple hundred. How long were you there? Schoenberg, I was there for three days. <clears throat> the Germans had uh, a makeshift uh, field hospital in a barn there in Schoenberg, and um, so I was taken there. And I, I, for three days, I watched the uh, wounded going in and going out, and theirs and, and ours, too. They, they took care of us well. And then from there? From there to uh, the village of Prum, and there loaded onto boxcars. And we didn't get far, it went overnight, and the next morning was Christmas Eve, the 24th of December, and we got accidentally strafed by our own planes. The boxcar that I was in, I, I was near the back of it, so my back was to the uh, uh, strafing planes. And I could see out of the corner of my eye, I could see the splinters of wood on the uh, bulkhead of the uh, car on either side of me. And um, I was unhurt. I got slivers of wood, but that was all. And there was a young paratrooper. I had just been talking or, or overhearing their conversation as they were talking. And uh, he got 
a um, 50 caliber bullet through the back of his head and out of his mouth. It left hardly a mark on him, but it, um, it fatally wounded him. Um, he was slow in dying. We, we tried, did the best we could to help him. And uh, when we thought that he had gone, he expired, um, we gave up. And then he showed some signs of life, and we tried again. It was, it was a terrible experience. Uh, we broke out of the boxcars. The guards flew, ran away on us, and um, we broke out and uh, then formed a big POW in the snow of ourselves. And uh, later that day, uh, planes came over and wagged their wings to let us know that they knew who we were. And then that night, we got back into the boxcars, and it, it was desperately cold then. And the, the dead were lined up outside, laid out in the snow, and we did our best to cheer ourselves up and survive through the night. And uh, it was then that we, we sang a few Christmas carols uh, and then comforted each other. What was the motivation the for that? The, the book sounded like it was a, a spur of the moment. Somebody recognized it was December 24th. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, it was just that, yeah. Yeah, we would, somebody did say, hey, it's, it's Christmas Eve. And they said, well, let's sing a few carols. So we did. How'd you feel? What was your emotion at that moment? At that moment? <clears throat> I mean, well, what a, what a day, when you, when you think yeah. about that day. Well, it's hard to say. Uh, and the terror of that day was over with, but we had the terror of the next day to face, too. Not knowing just what was... You didn't know from moment to moment if you were going to survive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you get a sense of that Christmas Eve, the, the hymnals, that this sort of was a, uh, maybe an uh, inspirational, even maybe even a... a it was a little, a little comfort, yeah, some comfort and some peace in the midst of all of that. Uh. I'd like at this point to uh, say that there were so many incidents in my life that were close calls, that in my experience, were close calls, and uh, I reflect upon that, and a, a favorite Bible verse that I have is uh, Psalm 27. The Lord is my, my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. And I feel that my life was preserved uh, miraculously and for a purpose of God. The further question is, what happened to the fellows who were even better than I and were not spared? Mm -hmm. But that's a mystery. And you always have to contemplate that and just be grateful to God and try to discover the mystery of it all. In 1943, in January, uh, they uh, said that I would be drafted and do the service. Mm -hmm. I said I didn't want to be in the Army. I said that I don't want to be puddling around in mud pies I'd rather be out in the ocean. <laughs> so I, they, at that time, I signed up for the Navy and then they let me graduate in 1943 from Lake, it was Lakewood High School then. And uh, they let me graduate and the week after I graduated, I left for boot camp. And from there on, it was all towards the Pacific. It had nine 16-inch guns. What we would do is we would line up battleships and we would fire into the shore to loosen things up and scatter any other people that were there before we went ash before the Army Navy went aboard shore. They would drop bombs on the battleships and cruisers. And we were firing a 40 millimeter gun and a Japanese kamikaze come down. He dropped a 250 pound bomb right in the center of where we were. 
Now the area we were in was no farther than that back wall. Uh, in other words, let's say the gun was right in the middle and we were surrounding. The eight of us were there handling ammo and uh, uh, we had what we call 20 millimeter machine guns and they were firing at these planes when they'd come in too. But this plane got through, dropped the bomb, and there the eight of us were around. The bomb hit right in the center of the area we were in where that quadrant was. There was, I was laying flat out. I looked up, I looked around, all seven of the men were dead, except me. I was the only one that survived, and I never had a scratch. And everybody else was gone. I'll never forget this in my whole life. But this is when you were talking about, about something that would happen. That's something that I will never forget. It was just almost impossible for me to realize when I looked around that the other seven were, were dead and I was the only one left. And the only thing I could do is that I was brought up as a Christian person, that I had been praying that God would protect me. And that's the only thing I could do is give credit to God for bringing me through that particular occasion. Well, it just was similar to having all the Japanese planes trying to knock us out. And to you talk about a turkey shoot, every ship in the force was firing at airplanes and airplanes were firing at ships. So you talk about a turkey shoot. We went aboard as the ship I was on, South Dakota. We had like, I don't remember how many, maybe 10 uh, sailors that went aboard the Nagato. In other words, we had a, a small boat that, uh, destroyer that took us alongside. And uh, we went aboard and they had a small crew of Japanese that stayed aboard. The rest all were evacuated when they signed a peace treaty. But we went ashore and we took uh, over and got a signature from the men in charge that we had taken the ship over. And at that time, like I say, I. I operated on my own, and we had the opportunity to do it. So I saw this flag, Japanese flag, hanging from the yard arm, and I, another buddy and I went up, took the flag down. That is the flag. Why don't you pull it out? Let's we'll get a formal picture of that, but that's amazing. Yeah. See, here's where they hooked it to the yard arms. And uh, so I've kept that folded in my house since I got home. When uh, uh, Eisenhower was president, uh, he was Missouri. They were, they were going to, at the first, indication they were going to sign the peace treaty aboard the USS South Dakota. And Eisenhower said, no, they're going to sign it on the Missouri. Now we were tied up, Missouri, South Dakota. If you can imagine two big battleships and they had a rail around the side. And this was the official signing 
of the peace treaty that the war was over and we weren't going to see any more shooting or firing or, or anything. Yesterday they celebrated the 70th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, you sat home, you wa probably watched it on television. Or I, s it? I saw some of it. What was your feeling? Well, it, it's a hard thing to explain. I mean, uh, it's just like a load on your shoulders. You know, you remember. Your remembrance is like a load of something on your shoulders. Even though it's all over with, it's something that you will never forget. And uh, I'm sure that every serviceman that was on either side, on the European side or on the Pacific side, there were days and there were weeks, there were months of things that happened that will never leave their minds. My father and mother could not speak a word of English. Uh. I had, I stayed most of my time with my parents so I could interpret people who came to visit them. And I'm very fluent in Polish and English. I can just switch like this. Mm -hmm. I, I, lo I took that as my course in drawing. Look at my hands. I could look at drawings and I could draw a whole locomotive. The whole picture of it. And then I could flip it over and, and drive and look at the locomotive from the bottom. And then I could flip it over and I could take a draw the picture what it looked like from the top. But I enlisted and I had a choice to be in the Air Force or Navy or whatever. I chose the Air Force. And we were going across the Atlantic but with no escorts or nothing. And, and the boat was going like this. Mm -hmm. All the way across the Atlantic and we, it was going back and forth, zigzagging so the submarines could get a beat on us. And we landed in, uh, in, in uh, Ujda. They have funny names. I had a half of a tent. Mm -hmm. And the other guy had the other half. And we put them together and we slept outside in Casablanca until the airplanes could come and pick us up. Oh, next thing I knew that, that we were going to invade Sicily. And I was in the ground crew. I was in the S2 department already. Troopers were going up into the plane. They had to have help to push them, push them in there. <coughs> because they were so loaded with guns, ammunition, and everything. They had to help them in there. When, when the invasion for Sicily came, the American ships starting to shoot at us, and they shot down a couple of our planes and a lot of pearl troopers got, before they could get to the island, they had to crash in the ocean and they drowned. Do you know why there was such confusion? I don't know. Nobody communicated with the Navy or nothing. Everybody was on their own, you know. It was the first real invasion we had. <laughs> 
American troops of General Patton's 7th Army move swiftly through western Sicily, taking town after town as they drive to join General Montgomery's British 8th Army. Through captured Tramini, Mersala, Trapani, Palermo, scenes are the same. More than 50,000 Axis prisoners surrender in the first three weeks of the campaign. Uh, General Patton was there too. Yeah. And Montgomery was on the, on the southern part. And what they were supposed to do is, is meet at the end of, before they could cross the ocean. Well, Patton got there and he's waiting for Montgomery to come in. But Montgomery stopped and they had to have their tea. <laughs> They had to have their tea. And a lot of Germans escaped across the channel into Italy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you ever meet Patton there when you were there? No, well, I heard all about him. What did you hear about him? Oh, he was a... He had no mercy on his troops. He just want him to move and move and move. See, our group, the 313 group, had four, they had four squadrons, <coughs> and then they had the headquarters. That's how they composed our, our group. So your, your 313th, your job was principally to drop the paratroopers. Well, you see, <clears throat> being in my category, I couldn't, they wouldn't let me fly in the planes. It was disaster that should never have happened. We never saw injuries like that. Secrecy clothed the actual doings of that night. Why was the bombing of Bari Harbour such a disaster? Why did people with negligible injuries mysteriously begin to die? Why did Eisenhower and Churchill decide to cover up the story, making the Bari disaster one of the most secret events of the Second World War? Oh, one day we were in Sicily, and I had a buddy who was a crew chief on a, on a C-47. Felix, we have an opening. I think I can get you in on the plane and we will go to Barrie, Italy. And we landed in Barrie. The airfield was so loaded with planes and we were supposed to come back. Mm. But, but, but they were so busy that they couldn't unload us, so we had to stay overnight. So, the, so that night we went to a movie. Now, I don't know what was playing, but it was transformed from, Eng from Italian to English, you know. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting in a theater, and all of a sudden, Everybody got up and they're all running out of the theater. I, so, so we joined them and we, and we ran out with the people and we went underground. And the Germans come by and they bombed the harbor. Mm. That was Barry. Now that was a secret because the, we weren't supposed to say a word, anything about it. The Germans come in there and they bombed the fleet and they killed about 2,000 mm. American merchant marines. Mm. And that was a no-no. We weren't supposed to say anything about it. A few days later, the name of an American ship began to circulate. It was underlined in official documents. The John Harvey. Why? What was this ship carrying? 
Why was it in Italy? What is the secret of this ship? This ship. We will dip into the nightmare of weapons that most frightened the civilians during the war. Chemical weapons. Next day we got on our... They sent us to the airfield. And we looked our plane over. And we had shrapnel in our tail and and parts of it in the wings a little bit. But it was flyable. So we got so we got the okay to take off. I got pictures of us flying in the in our plane because we had those little holes. I was sick my camera in her and I take a picture of the other planes that were flying back to Sicily. We were training for dropping paratroopers. Mm -hmm. And after we dropped paratroopers, we turned back and we would get supplies. And at that time we had the C-47s. At first, at first I didn't have too much to do. But my, I was sent into the, into internal intelligence department. I was called to headquarters, and uh, and I had to draw on parchment paper of where our planes were leaving, and where the and where and where they were connecting up with the other two prayer groups. And I used to draw on parchment paper that when they got shot down, they were supposed to eat that. That was my job to do that for the pilots. I got a call to headquarters. Oh my God, what did I do now? But they said, no, don't worry about it. We're going to give you a Jeep and you're going to have to get up in the morning while everybody is sleeping. And you go down to the mess hall and get your breakfast. And, then we, and we don't want you back at your Quonset house until everybody is sleeping. Hmm. And when I come back to the base, to my quarters. All the crew chiefs were in that same Quonset house. And not one of them asked me a question of what was going on. But they didn't have to ask me. They knew something was up. And D-Day was coming. I didn't know when D-Day was going to be. But we took a little bet. And I think it was a little under $300 we collected on when D-Day was going to be. But I didn't know anything about it. But all the crew chiefs were in my bay in my Quonset hut, and they knew that something was up. Before the first assault takeoff, in each man's ears rang Eisenhower's inspiring order of the day. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. The tide has turned. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. 
we will accept nothing less than full victory. So who won the bet? I picked uh, D-Day for June 8th, and the next one in our outfit pick is June 10th. That's where I want my money. Yeah, yeah. I could use it. What'd you do with the money? How'd you spend it? I send a lot of it to my folks. Oh, you were in England. Yeah. Well, then they, then they, and then they shift us to France. Huh. And while we were in France, our headquarters were in a German bunker. And over the bunker, they had grass growing over the, over the, that bunker. And that's where we had our office. And the war was on. I had, I had a big map that I had to take care of. Oh, by my big map. And I had to keep where all the troops were. Because I, I used to get a teletype coming in, and I could point, 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 point where all the troops were. That was my job. So you knew before everybody else how things were progressing. You'd get information from the field, and then you'd map it out there. But I couldn't tell anybody anything about it. Yeah. That was a, that was a secret between the, the headquarters and the, and the main army, you know. And that was kept a secret, so my mouth was shut out, so I, I couldn't tell you anything. I was in London. You were? What was it like? What was, was there celebration going on? Yeah, in London, yeah. And uh, I met a Russian soldier who could speak Russian, and we went to a Russian princess that lived in London, and I met the princess. Did you? What, what, did you have some vodka? Well, she was from Russia. No, did you celebrate with some vodka? No. <laughs> no, I never drank. You know, a lot of soldiers drank, uh, drank that uh, cognac, you know. Yep. But I wasn't, but I wasn't in that category. I, I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I led a clean life. Mm -hmm. And every time I got my pack of cigarettes, I would give them to my second lieutenant in our outfit. You've been in the service. You've been gone since 1942. You come home. What was the reunion like when you met your mom and dad? My mother got the neighbor next door to meet me at their train station. She picked me up, and and her neighbor is the one who drove my car back to my home on seven forty three. East 18th Street. And, uh, and two weeks after I got home, I got married. It's my wife there. Yeah. Your wife, was there a lot of mail? We, we wrote in English. Okay. <clears throat> I used to write to my mother in Polish. And my mother would get that letter from me, and she would run to her neighbor who would read the letter for her. Well, these are all my pins. Yeah. That's a good conduct medal. Yeah. And I think that one is the European. European. Mm -hmm. I think these are, what, what are these, John? Overseas. Huh? Overseas stripes. Overseas stripes. And this one, 
that's for three years, at least three years in the service. Yeah, I was in the service a little over three years. And you got your sergeant stripes? Yeah, that's my sergeant strip. Well, we salute you. We thank you very much for sharing your story, your time, and this has worked out great for us. Do you remember where you were December 7th, 1941? Yeah. I was in... Rutgers prep school, mm -hmm. sitting, listening to all of the uh, Japanese bombers in her Pearl Harbor, sitting in the main auditorium. Okay. From that point on, I went into the service in 42, started actually in 43. Eighth Air Force, Great Ashfield is where I flew out of. In the month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Army's Eighth Air Force is established in Savannah, Georgia. It has seven men and no planes. Less than a year later, it is tasked with defeating the most powerful air force in the world, the German Luftwaffe. 26,000 Eighth Air Force men will die more than the U.S. Marines lost in all of World War II. I was in the 459th Heavy Bombardment Group of the 8th Air Force. Right. What did I get? The Air Medal, two Bronze Stars, whatever. The first mission we had, you close your ears. <laughs> We're, going, we're flying through and I'm looking ahead and there's all kinds of blackness throughout the sky and it's all shrapnel from any aircraft. And I hear over the income, keep a tight asshole. I flew as a crew member uh, in a B-17. As soon as we got to the English Channel, I got on the guns, and I was a left, left gunner. Mm -hmm. And I did other things. Uh, when you bomb, sometimes you have so many planes that you don't have a bombardier, and we didn't, so you, what they call, uh, trigger from the initial, the first bomber. So I used to have to pull pins, walk in the bomb bay and pull pins. More than 1,000 American and British heavy bombers will target German aircraft factories and industrial facilities. I remember we're bombing Royen, one of the last strongholds of the damn Nazis in uh, France. And we were carrying these bombs with gel in them. And that was in the bomb bay and I was in the radio room and I looked up and the more altitude you got, the more this gel came out. And I thought, holy <coughs> hell, if we get hit by this thing, this is a flaming co coffin. Mm -hmm. Is that when you threw up in your gas mask? Uh, what? <laughs> is that when you threw up in your <coughs> gas mask? I, I did that a couple times. The commanding officer talks to you and tells you where you're going to go. And there's all groans. <laughs> We're going to go to Essen today. Essen is where they make all the bam ball bearings, and you've got a lot of action there. So that's what you do. When you group at first thing in the morning, and it's early, and you've got fog, and you have to group in layers of bombing planes. Uh, and they all get together by uh, shooting a, a flare of different colors ah. to know what bomb group or, or what layer you're in. Right. And man, when you've got look out the window and some plane is sticking in your bomb bay, it's uh, <coughs> then you keep it tight. <laughs> Number of planes go out on a mission. Some of them don't come back with you. Uh, some planes get shot down. Uh, did you have that experience where some of your group was sure. lost? 
Sure. When you finally land and somebody's counting planes, what goes on in your mind? What goes on in your mind? Not every... I'm, a, I'm, I'm 8, 19, 20 years old. I'm thinking, thank you, Lord God, I'm here back safe. Right. And you walk into a line, and the first thing you do is give you a little glass of Calvados. You drink that and say, can I have some more? And they say, no. How did you feel when some of your friends didn't make it back? I don't know what I might say. Remorse, sad, but glad, glad that I was alive. Mm -hmm. And I think now of some great <coughs> good friends I had in high school that didn't come back. And and I thought, geez, even now I wish I'd have been more friendly to them. Mm -hmm. Guys that I knew. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Well, I'll give you an idea of how the people felt about us. And I don't know if that's true of all the ministers, but when we worked, first came in here and the women greeted us and were board, putting us in different locations. And she said, oh, you guys are a, uh, a mess to us. And I said to him, well, we didn't ask to be here. The saying was, the Americans are over sex, over paid, and over here. You've heard that before. That's how they felt. Were you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, down Piccadilly, there was a lot of women there, and there's some guy standing on the corner, a little old man. He says, papers, 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 rubbers, rubbers, rubbers. He provided a service. That's good. Full, full service. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's what it was. Yeah. In London at all? Sure. Yeah. Were you there during that? Yeah. Were, were, they, were they still smile. bombing? Were they still bombing London at the time? At the end, of, we were there during the damn bus bombs. Yeah, I remember running for shelters. And there really was not much advance notice, was there? The Nothing. Just a siren and then you ran. I am no hero. I had my missions. One of the scariest missions was after the war Amsterdam Holland was undated by water to stop the Nazis mm -hmm. but it also stopped them from eating no farmland no nothing we were called in to drop food to them mm -hmm. you flew in at 500 feet with all these other planes around I get out in the bomb bay no damn rope to hold me or anything, just standing out there and I'm supposed to throw out all this food in bags. And you flew at a low altitude because if you went up too high, the bags would be destroyed and the food would be destroyed. And I looked down there at the land and I said, Judas, priest, if I fall out of here, I'm not going to open a parachute. Wow. <laughs> I'm just talking to myself. Yeah. But I think of this every once in a while. And I say to myself, you know, White, the Lord's with you. You're pretty lucky. And I was walking the beach. And here's a guy coming out from my left from a townhouse. And we came together. And I said, hi, how are you? And I was talking to him. just from leaving. He says, I'm from Holland. I said, oh, yeah, whereabouts? He says, Amsterdam. Well, I said, I knew Amsterdam. I dropped some food for you guys. He said, you saved our lives. He says, I was 19 years old, standing in the top of a building watching you people drop the food. Wow. Made, made me feel good. Yeah. Yeah. And I can remember after the war, our pilot took us over on top of the Eiffel Tower and we did a figure eight around the Eiffel Tower. Wow. That was to me quite a, I looked down and there was the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. My brother,
who was six years older than I was, was killed. He was a captain uh, flying the hump, who supplying Still, Stillman, Still, General Stillman, for the Japs, fighting the Japs, and he was killed, uh, lost his way. It was a long time before we in the family could find out what happened to him mm -hmm. until such time as uh, the, the Army came to me, the Air Force came to me and said that a herdsman was walking into the Himalaya Mountains and found the remains of this plane. They couldn't get him out because he was a pilot and he hit the uh, side of a mountain and the nose buckled up. Mm. And they had no way of getting his remains out because the plane was so heavy. But we went to Arlington and uh, went through a ceremony for the remains of the other four members of his crew and celebrated his, in honor of him. Yeah. My mother was the hero, because I was flying in, 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 out of uh, England and my brother was killed and she was tough on her. Mm -hmm. Awful. My father had been passed away since 39, so it was only my <coughs> brother left, my mother left with the my younger brother, so it was really tough on her. Right. She was a real hero. Right. So you come back to the States, at some point you have a reunion with your mother. Yep. What was that like? Heart, heartwarming. Uh, a lot of... Uh, you know what bothers me? As a 91 uh, old fart, thinking back, kids and people don't understand what we went through. Because this is the greatest war in the history of man. 